I'm going to bring us from the Middle East now to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I, I, I traveled to the, the reservation for the Tohono O'odham people, which are an, an American, well, they're a First Nations group that has, has been in, in, in the Sonora Desert uh, before there was in America or Mexico, and their, their, their territory spans, uh, spans the, the two countries. And um, what the, the Tohono O'odham do is they, 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 they travel on these ceremonial routes that have been there for centuries to, to perform rituals and this kind of thing. And I, and I went down there and I met with a woman named Ophelia who was an elder and uh, uh, who lived just next to the, to the wall that now separates that land. Uh, what used to be open, open desert is now divided by, this, by this, the American uh, border wall. Uh, Ophelia sat across from me and folded her hands, nodding with arthritis like tree roots on the tabletop. She wore a thick flannel shirt against the November breeze and a floral orange skirt. Her hair was straight and black. When she started to speak, I had to lean forward to hear her. Like all the Odom I met, Ophelia spoke in soft, reverent tones, as if she was continuously occupying the sacred space. And she was. According to the Odom Himdog, the canon of beliefs, stories, and rituals that govern Odom life, all Odom territory, from the northern reaches of the desert to the Cortez seashore, is holy land. We are directed by creation to maintain the area by doing our ceremonies, Ophelia whispered, by doing our prayer offerings, doing our songs to specific mountains, gathering medicine. Because their land spanned beyond the international line, the wall not only divided the territory, it desecrated it. Some of the traditional ceremonies occur on the other side of the border. The annual rebirthing ritual takes place in the ceremonial grounds at Kitawak, about 30 kilometers south of the line. The ritual has been going on since the beginning of the world, Ophelia told me. We wait for the saguaro fruit to turn red, because that is when we have the ceremony. The ripening fruit is the Odom call to prayer. The elders cross the border with medicine bundles holding the sacred implements of the ritual. I asked Ophelia what the bundles contained, but she wouldn't tell me. There are certain secret things that are held by the singers in a sacred way, she said, with careful ambiguity. And some items are related to rain, to water, and clouds that represent the directions, the colors, the animals, and the plants. I spoke with her in front of her house for a little while, and then she brought me, well, and then this happened. She sat silent for a moment and looked down at her hands. When she raised her eyes, she asked if I would like to see the wall. We got into my car, and she guided me along the paths to the border. It was late afternoon, and shadows extended from the fence across the dirt road on the American side. Aside from the occasional gust of November wind that shook the choya cactus and swept dust into our eyes, the borderline was quiet. Ophelia was quiet too, and her presence lent the scene a kind of sacred stillness. She told me we were lucky. The silence was too often punctured by helicopters and border patrol ATVs. A row of steel posts linked with three strands of wire cable stood along the borderline. The posts were sunk five feet into the ground and filled with concrete slurry to stop trucks from barreling through. The posts were spread far enough apart, however, that anyone on foot could step through the wall. The Department of Homeland Security originally wanted to build a solid wall here. Environmentalists and members of the Odom Nation objected, but Ophelia figured the DHS was deterred by the cost, not by anything else. Besides, the Department of Homeland Security kept their options open Ophelia pointed to metal clips on the tops of the posts where the government could hang steel panels and seal off the border to foot traffic. They did it in Yuma, she said. The National Guard came in with plates of metal and put it together like a Lego. It could change at any time. I feel like they are preparing for war. The wall traveled straight along the border, along the border except where it abruptly veered off the line and curved around a tall cactus to place the plant on the south side of the barrier. The diversion around the cactus baffled Ophelia. How did the Border Patrol decide this cactus was a Mexican cactus? She laughed. And then she stepped across the border to pose for a photo in front of the saguaro. She invited me over the line, and I squeezed past the post to join her on the other side. I stood there for a moment before stepping back into the United States. Stories of remote drones and omniscient Border Patrol spooked me. I live across America's other border and know how easily one can find his name on a border crossing blacklist. I didn't want to risk being forever banned from the United States for the thin prank of pushing past some fence, some fence posts <coughs> to Mexico. 
people have to realize that the barrier is permanently there, Ophelia said. And because it is permanent, it changes forever who we are. Before I said goodbye to Ophelia, she told me about the elders who died the year the wall went up. That year we lost 11 elders. One after another they passed away. It just seemed like they couldn't comprehend what was happening. Seeing their sacred land bifurcated and dishonored poisoned them somehow. The wall disease can be terminal. Almost every month we were having death ceremonies. I had longer hair back then and I kept cutting it to honor the elders who died. By the end of the year, my hair was gone. The last thing I had to do what a writer is never supposed to do, I'm gonna read the end of the book to you. <laughs> and then Russell and I can talk. In 1992, on the occasion of Montreal's 350th birthday, the city of Berlin gave the city a rough sliver of concrete about three meters tall and a meter wide, salvaged from the wall's great fall. Vivid graffiti covers what was the western side of the slab. An orange sunburst, swirls of green and blue. The letters E-A-S, no doubt part of a longer word, truncated when the wall came down. There's no such decoration on the severe eastern side, just a few numbers and initials, the lost acronyms of the Iron Curtain. The slab used to form part of the anti-fascist <coughs> protection bulwark near Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. Now it stands in a shopping mall on the first floor of Montreal's World Trade Center, a name that sounded less ominous back in 1992. I considered a downtown shopping mall an undignified resting place for a fragment of the Berlin Wall. A mall is a place to find an orange Julius, not an exalted remnant of the Cold War. Then again, all the walls I'd seen represented the trade and transfer of goods. Smugglers carried toilet paper through the walls in Morocco and lifted cattle over the fences in Northeast India. Coyotes led migrant workers past the wall, narcos pushed drugs through it, and kids from Park X walked around it in search of candy. Shoppers in Nicosia knew that the prices were lower on the other side of the dead zone. Both the berm in the Western Sahara and the wall in the West Bank hoarded valuable real estate. Sometimes the wall itself became a commodity. In Ramallah, an artist named Basil Abbas complained how the wall had become a simplified and easily digestible symbol for activists to consume. Tourists posed for photos in front of Belfast barriers, paid Bethlehem taxi drivers to show them graffiti on the West Bank wall, and passed through the barricades in Nicosia for the thrill of crossing through forbidden space. Each wall, symbol, each wall symbolized commerce in one way or another. The shard of the Berlin Wall reminds us that walling is a human impulse. The ancient emperors of Rome and China taught us this first and passed along a hereditary urge to harden our edges with bricks and mortar, barbs and steel. I travel to see what happens after the walls rise and to learn what it means to live alongside a wall. I discovered that the walls breed societies of resistance in their shadows. Resilient men and women, such as Patricia, Melina, and Rocky, who physically defeated their walls. Artists who drew down the walls by reimagining them. Activists who worked to dress the wounds the walls inflicted. Although I never found a wall about to fall, I did find a kind of optimism in the actions of the resistors, a faint glance to an imagined time when the walls stand disassembled in distant shopping malls. This is what I had wanted to find. But I found more despair than hope. I found families shattered along the walls and bodies scarred. I learned of withered dead lying in deserts and saw hate boil hot and steady. Torn flesh, and thrown stones did not stall the new Hadrians, nor did the tears of mothers and migrants and refugees dissuade them. The walls rise and grow and multiply. They are both human and inhumane. The walls are our compulsion. The walls are our chronic disease. The cracked relic of the Berlin Wall stood in downtown Montreal because it revealed something else. The urge to tear down barriers is a stronger impulse the urge to build them. We cannot help but subvert the walls. What eventually wins out is not the crude desire to wall, but the impulse to break through. The peace of the Berlin Wall in Montreal was a gift to the city, a trophy, because it symbolized a fallen wall and a barrier that surrendered to a human compulsion greater than that which built it. The fragment reminds us of the inevitability of our better natures 
and in this the constant thrum of hope. The walls will continue to rise, and we will continue to tear them down.